these people have seen and promise us to tell all because the hired help tells all is the focus of this edition of Parabe. I also want to introduce Mike Walker. He's the gossip editor and the columnist for the National Enquirer. He's the guy who edits those two pages that everybody turns to first when they pick up the Enquirer. I want to start right with you, Larry, out in Los Angeles, joining us via satellite. You've heard all those stories that were so rampant a year ago. The king of rock and roll never died back in 1977, that it was all a charade so he could become a private citizen. Elvis is still alive. I know that you know from first hand that that is not the case. Why? That's exactly right, Geraldo. In fact, that's the very introduction to, to our book. It starts at the funeral uh, parlor in Memphis when I was asked by Vernon Presley to go and prepare Elvis's hair for his funeral. And you can imagine the shock. I mean, I, I'm sure you knew where you were that day. Most people do when they heard that Elvis died. When I, when I arro arrived on the scene at the, at the Memphis uh, parlor to do his hair, it was 8 o'clock in the morning. There were thousands and thousands of people outside. It was hot and muggy. There were uh, uh, helicopters buzzing up, up ahead. I was led into a building by a dozen or so police officers, and they led me down this corridor. And I was thinking as I'm walking down, how am I going to do this? How, is this real? Is this a nightmare? Is it, what, what? I felt like, my, like I was hemorrhaging inside. And then I was led into a room, and there's Elvis lying on a table. And it was the most awesome reality to to present itself so now, was your job then to dress the king up so he would look his best on that ex his ex exactly final you know, public appearance you know a few months earlier he said he said hey i know what the public is thinking i know what people are saying i know how i look but i'll tell you what i'm going to look good in my casket and that kept ricocheting back and forth in my mind i walked into the room i looked at elvis and I wasn't prepared that he had a regrowth of white hair because we were off, off touring for about six weeks. And after working with someone so intimately for so many years, Geraldo, you know that person, you know that person's body. And I proceeded to, uh, to uh, do Elvis's hair. It took quite a while, it took about an hour. Uh, one of Elvis's uh, friends and associates, Charlie Hodge, assisted me and I can tell you categorically that the truth of the matter is Elvis did die in 1977 and uh, so I can get a little bit of information Geraldo when she, when she was on your program did she speak about uh, that picture in the National Enquirer that didn't look like Elvis oh the woman who maintained that Elvis wasn't dead the one that fabricated the story. Yeah, I don't even remember. I wasn't listening that closely. Well, you know, she quoted me in, in her book, and she said that I pasted Elvis's sideburns on, and she got that from Albert Goldman's book, which was you, you, Are you saying that, you know, just to make this, to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, Elvis really had white or gray hair? He had white hair. I dyed his hair black for, for many, many years. In fact, in 1956 is when he first started to dye his hair black. 56? 1956, yes, in Loving You. I wasn't working for him then. I started working for Elvis in 1964. But during all those years, I dyed his hair black. You know, he was yeah. concerned. You mentioned his appearance. Yeah. He was overweight. I mean, he was very heavy. He was Elvis fed, was fed, to very, be cool. Well, he was bloated, Geraldo. Elvis had tremendous physical problems. He had glaucoma. He had hypertension. He had a spastic colon. And he thought he was, he thought perhaps he had cancer. Now, Mary Jenkins is here in our New York studio nodding her head. Now, I understand he was troubled physically, but tell us what Elvis's favorite snack was, Mary. What his favorite snack was peanut butter and banana sandwich. I want to be right back because we asked Mary to prepare uh, a sample of what Elvis liked to eat. Now, take a look at this. This is not what you call health food, though, is it? <laughs> now you eat very many of these now you're probably a great 
banana and peanut butter sandwich maker. <laughs> but, yeah, you can't I have too many of these. I didn't eat too be. many of them. What? But he just loved them. He did? Oh, like, yeah. Would he eat a whole bunch? Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time that I ever made some for him, that morning I walked into the dining room and uh, I said, You ready for your breakfast? He said, Yes. He said, I got something new for you this morning. I said, what is it? He said, peanut butter and banana sandwich. I said, what? Just like that. And he said, yeah, I brought it, this menu back with me, this uh, recipe. And uh, Priscilla said, Mary, don't get excited. She said, he made me go back five times before I got it right. And uh, the first time I went, I fixed them, brought them back. Uh-uh, that's not right. A second time, the same thing. Third time, the same thing. And the fourth time, his father, he said, Mary, I'm going to go in the kitchen and help you see if we can get it right. And when we got in the kitchen, he said, let's toast the bread first and then fix the sandwich. And we did. We toast the bread, put the peanut butter on there, and then sliced the bananas. And I had no idea that peanut butter and banana could be that complicated. <laughs> well, it's Joan, good. Hannah, what did uh, Frank's... For the lady on the end, Elvis's cook, yeah. Mary. Um, I hear everyone complaining about, like, Zsa, Zsa and Mr. Sinatra. Um, how was Elvis, as a, you know, an employer, was he nice to you? Lovely. He was a wonderful person. And he did so many wonderful things for me. In 74, he bought me a beautiful home and a new car for my Christmas prayers. And when he pays, everybody, my phone rang all night long asking me, what did he, they didn't, they wasn't interested in him dying. They wanted to know what did he leave me? I said, he give me mine whilst he was alive. And he was a wonderful person. He would help anybody that needed help if he knew it. Geraldo? Yes, Larry. He's just Can a I wonderful person. Go ahead. It, you know, Geraldo, it's, it's unbelievable to me. I'm hearing these stories of people calling Mr. and Mrs. and the rigidity and the formalities. Elvis was the most extraordinary person in terms of That's he right. would give so much of himself to other people, he like would. Mary was saying, but cars, homes, jewelry, transplants, kidneys. Right. I never saw a day go by in Elvis's life where he didn't give something he was so appreciative that he was in the position that he was in we would we would be at the studios and and one of the uh, workers would say mr presley he say, no no call me elvis never mr presley always elvis right. very informal was rose he, kennedy barbara that informal uh, no not really she was very easy to be around but she wasn't that informal <laughs> and um that in that way she was very inspiring to was me was she like elvis a generous person uh, no, no, she was too penurious to be generous. She's very stingy. Uh, if she gave... Priscilla really like? Priscilla was a wonderful person, but you had to learn her to know. Now, the first day that I started working there, I don't know, it looked like I was afraid of her. And uh, I watched, when I first started to work in there, I was the maid, because they had a cook, and they didn't need a cook. And uh, I washed that day, and I, I forgot to wash it, I ironed. And the best pair of pajamas she had, I was ironing them, and I taken the whole plug out of them. I said, oh, Lord, I just got here today, and I'm fixing to leave today. <laughs> and she got, they got up and uh, got ready for dinner, and I went into the dining room. She said, Mary, you look, what's wrong with you? She said, you look mighty sad. I said, well, it's sad time. She said, what is it? I said, I was ironing your pajamas, and I taken a plug out of them, and I know you're going to find me. She said, oh, Mary, throw them things in the garbage and go on back to doing what you're doing. <laughs> so when she said that, I just felt so much better. I just felt like a new person. And from then on, I learned her. And the older she got, and the longer I stayed there, the better she was. And she's a sweet person. Okay, do you think... I have a question about Elvis. I've always wondered, how come he couldn't get good medical care? Larry? Yes. Why couldn't Elvis get the right doctors? Elvis had too many doctors. It was yeah, really I, I knew some of them, too. He had, and not only did he have different doctors, but none of them were in touch with one another. He had drug prescribers. He didn't have doctors. 
he, that, exactly, they prescribed medications to him and the guy was really a victim of a horrendous situation. And remember, in 1977, and until now we've come a long way, there, were, there was no Betty Ford Clinic. There, there, people weren't revealing that they had problems with substance or alcohol or whatever. Elvis wanted to come clean. He was looking for a way to change himself, and he knew that stories were coming out, and that's why this book, If I Can Dream, came into being in the first place, because he asked me, and of all the books that have come out, this is the only book that has been authorized by Elvis, and I think it's a very important point. And in this book, he wanted people to know not only the great things about his life and his aspirations and his spiritual quest, but he wanted people to know the downside and his struggles and what he was going through. And I was keeping a diary at that time, thank God. And that's why this book is so qualitatively different because this is everything that Elvis had to say about his life, about his mother, about death, about drugs, about you name it. And he certainly you know, had a lot of ups and downs. I mean, at the end of his life, he was really a, almost a pathetic shell of the man he had been. Well, I must say uh, something, uh, Geraldo. Behind the scenes, behind closed doors, Elvis's mind was as lucid as ever. He was as vital as ever. And yet he was bombarding his, his system with things that he thought the doctors were helping his problems with. Placidil, second all, dilaudid. I mean, the man was a walking drugstore. Got to take a break. And we'll find out about Elvis's temper. Mary wants to My beloved Millie has a question. What on? Well, I, you know, once in a while when I see Gerardo having a little too many margaritas, he loved margaritas, I say, hey, hey. Excuse me, uh, next question, I have another question. <laughs> uh, Mary, Mary, do you ever dare to tell Elvis, you know, son, you're not looking too good, why don't you seek some help, you know, I love you and I hate to see you like that, looking like that. Don't you ever say anything to him? To, to Elvis? To Elvis? Well, uh, I would do uh, my part. I would do what the doctor, the doctor asked all of us to help him to get on a diet, to stay on the diet that he put him on. But all of you probably knew that the doctors were killing him. I would have called the doctors, I would have said to the doctors, you all get out of here. And, 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 well, and you know, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, no, yeah. no. Yeah. She would have, I promise. The, the food that the doctor was giving us authorities to give him, it wasn't killing him. Well, she's oh. talking about pills. She's not talking about Oh, pills. Well, now, pills. No, I, I had a lot of people that asked me about that. And I was around him more than anybody except his wife, I think. Well, you could have helped him. But I, did, I never seen him look like he was oh, on a pill. You could have helped him, Mary. I, if I, I you two could get together later now. I, Excuse I, me. You're if I had to know he was on it, but I didn't Hi, know I'd just like to know if any of you are current... I had several. They'll keep carrying on. <laughs> I'd just like to know if any of you are currently with I want to quickly mention the, uh, the three books that have already been published here. Well, I've got a minute left. Larry Geller, we mentioned, If I Can Dream. Mary's book is uh, Memories Beyond Graceland Gate. Fiona again? Actually, I got uh, four movies coming out this year that I'm in, and I'm never going back to work for anybody again. You know, Victor and Ricardo sitting right next to me. Don't they look like Elvis impersonators? They don't know, they they do a Vegas act. <laughs> We're not going to sing. We don't sing. <laughs> John, we know who your least favorites were. Who were your favorites to work for? My very favorites, Dudley Moore, Anthony Newley, Aaron Spelling, Tony Bennett. Mary, would you tell Elvis's secrets if someone offered you enough money? No. If I knew anything bad on him, I wouldn't tell it, but I don't. And I told them, I said, I don't know anything bad that I could tell you about him. But if I did, I wouldn't tell it to you. Thank you all so much. And I want to say one more. I'm having rice and beans tonight for Millie. Thank you folks for being here. You folks enough for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike.